Thank you, Isaiah. Good morning. Have you ever been in a crisis? I mean a real crisis. Not I'm panicked because I'm running late for class or I didn't get my homework done on time, but crisis. No hope, dark, crushing, I see no way out type of crisis. Most of us at one point have been in such a situation and some of us in this room are in a situation like that right now. Think about how that time felt. Were you frightened? Can't breathe? Panicked? Alone? Pain? Tears? I'm with you. I know that feeling and it's terrible. It's crushing. And when we're there, we think it's gonna last forever. And then, sometimes, when you least expect it, sometimes the miracle happens. Sometimes the prayer is answered. Sometimes relief comes. Sometimes the cancer goes into remission. Sometimes the bill is miraculously paid. Sometimes the unexpected apology comes. Sometimes there is reconciliation and breakthrough. Sometimes there is deliverance. And that's what we're gonna talk about here this morning. The deliverance of the Lord. Because this is a Psalm that we need during times of crisis. It is a much needed reminder of how God brings us from tears to joy. Pray with me. Jesus, good morning. As we dive into your word, as we look at this psalm, we pray that you would be at work in our lives, in our hearts, that you would be stirring us, that you would be drawing us to yourself. God, we pray that my words would be your words and that what you need to speak to each heart would be what is heard here this morning. To God be the glory, amen. As Taylor reminded us, we are looking at the Psalms of Ascent. And so I'll just say that these Psalms of Ascent, they were sung by worshipers as they made their pilgrimage up to Jerusalem for the annual feasts. Well, we here are not making a literal pilgrimage, but the Christian life is a climb. It's a journey of constant growth, of sacrifice, of trusting God when we can't see. And these psalms, these songs, they're for us as we pilgrimage through this life. And it can be a hard climb at times. And these psalms are meant to strengthen us and to encourage us on our way. This psalm today, Psalm 126, it's short, it's just six verses, and it's divided into two sections. The first part is looking back at what God has done. It's remembering a time when God delivered his people Israel. It's remembering with gratitude and joy the mighty acts of God. And then the second part is a prayer it's a prayer to God asking him to do it again. It's like the cheer that says, we want another one just like the other one. We want another one just like the other one. Score again. Make a layup again. Another touchdown. Come through. Score big. We need it now. We want another one just like that other one. Verse one says, when the Lord brought back the captives to Zion, we were like men who dreamed. Now Mount Zion was the symbol for Jerusalem and Jerusalem itself represents the place where God dwelled with his people. So this is significant, this is their home, but it's where they meet with their God. And Psalm 126, 126 is a song that looks back to when the Israelites returned 
home. You see, they've been in captivity for 70 years in Babylon. What had happened was that the Babylonians came and they completely destroyed Jerusalem and they hauled the Israelites off a thousand miles away from their homeland to Babylon. And this is where they've been as slaves, as captives for 70 years. And it was awful. It was awful there for them. It says in Psalm 137, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the poplars, we hung our harps, for there our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? Remember that time of crisis that I asked you to think of? That time of despair? You felt like all hope was lost? Well, that was the Israelites in Babylon. They were hopeless. They were in despair and they were tormented and held captive. Do you hear the mockery? Do you hear the mockery in the voice of the captors as they say, sing us one of the songs of Zion? Well, they know full well that Jerusalem is destroyed by their own hand. The Israelites, they have no song left in them. They were devastated. And then, then suddenly and miraculously, they were released after 70 years in captivity. Cyrus, the new king, makes a proclamation that they can go home, that they're free to go back to Zion, to Jerusalem, they're free to go home. The Lord has brought them back. It must have felt too good to be true. Like they were dreaming. One of those experiences where you, you pinch yourself to see if you're really awake. Is this really happening? If you've read the book of Job, I can imagine that this is how Job felt when his fortunes were restored. Or how Peter felt when he was released from prison. Acts 12 says, Peter had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. Or my friend who after six miscarriages delivered her baby boy and held him in her arms. Or another friend who after years of searching for a job and rejection letter after rejection letter held an acceptance offer in his hand. Or me, after years of singleness and longing to be married, January 20th, 2007, Right here in this very chapel, I walked down that aisle towards my husband to be. <laughs> okay, yeah, there he is in the back if we want to woohoo that. <laughs> but you know what that felt like? That felt like, pinch me. I must be dreaming. I've longed for this for so long and it's actually happening. You see, without the understanding of the depth and the pain, you can't fully appreciate the joy of the fulfillment. And so verse two says, our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with shouts of joy. When the tears and the sorrow are so overwhelming, sometimes you wonder if you will ever laugh again. Just a couple weeks ago, two or three weeks ago, I said to a friend of mine, I miss being happy. I remember being happy, but I miss just that natural feeling of happiness and laughter in my life. I've been struggling with ongoing health issues coming up on three years with no end in sight. And it takes an emotional toll I can remember it, but it's kind of a ways off. But, but when you are in those bleakest, darkest seasons, when he rescues, 
when he delivers after all hope seems lost, laughter and song and joy, they do return. Read with me, verses two and three. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we are filled with joy. What God did for Israel was so incredible that everyone noticed. This wasn't just for Israel who was being delivered, but it was also for the surrounding nations. They too saw the deliverance of the Lord. They too saw what God had done. But not to be outdone, the Israelites claimed it as their story. And so they sang the song. They said, God has done great things for us. Their deliverance brought them such incredible joy that their hearts were overwhelmed with praise for God. And this is the natural overflow that happens when we are delivered. You know the saying, good news travels fast? Well, the reason it travels so fast is because we're so excited and we can't keep quiet about it. I mean, think about it. What do you do when something great happens in your life? You post it, you tweet it, you snap it, you call your best friend about it, you shout it from the rooftops because the heavy burden has been lifted. The day of your deliverance has come and you are filled with joy. Can you remember? Do you remember a time like that, with the Lord's deliverance? Because that feeling of joy for the psalmist, it's a memory. It's not his current situation. You see, it's the way the psalm ends that tells us the current context. The psalmist is in a situation in which he and the people of God need deliverance. And so he's remembering back to a previous time of deliverance, reminding himself of who God is, reminding himself of God's power and God's love for his people. And he's doing this because frankly, we forget. It can feel like a dream. Did that ever really happen? Because when we're in crisis, the good things that have happened in the past can feel like a dream. And so we need to remember. We need to remind ourselves of the truth of what really happened. But then here in the present, the psalmist is in need of deliverance. It's not enough to just remember the past. We need to invite God into our present. It's not enough to just remember the past. We need to invite God into our present. And my very favorite description of this psalm, um, I read it in a sermon by a pastor, Duncan. He says, it's a memory turned into a prayer. This psalm is a memory turned into a prayer. The psalmist in his time of trouble is reflecting back on past deliverances, reflecting back on the Lord's faithfulness, reminding himself that the God who was faithful then, the God who delivered his people then, who filled them with joy when all hope seemed lost, he will be faithful again. The God who was faithful then will be faithful again. And so the prayer of the psalmist is very simple. Restore our fortunes, O Lord. Remember God when you restored us before? When you busted us out of captivity in Babylon and you brought us home? Remember that? Well, God, I'm in trouble like that again. And I need you to deliver me again. I know that you can because you've done it before. And so I'm asking you, do it again. As we reflect this month on black history in America, I can't help but think of our African-American brothers and sisters whose story was also one of captivity and slavery. This psalm would have been their heart's cry. 
In fact, this psalm is what so many of their spirituals, their soul songs, were about. They were remembering back to times when God had freed and delivered his people. When Moses freed the Israelites from slavery in Egypt, when God's people were released from Babylonian captivity, and they were begging him to do it again, just as this psalm does. And in their songs, they remembered who God was. They remembered what he did in the past for his people, and they sang these songs to keep those memories in the forefront of their minds. It was real, it wasn't a dream. God had delivered his people, and so free us again. And this psalm, it speaks of deliverance on two levels. First, there is the spiritual deliverance from sin. God's power, it releases us from sin's captive hold on us, and it brings us back to him. There is no greater deliverance. There is no greater joy. There is no greater truth but it also speaks of a physical deliverance. The psalmist is remembering when the Lord set his people free and brought them back to Zion. It was a literal, physical deliverance. And when the African-American slaves sang these songs of freedom, there was a dual meaning to their words. They longed for both spiritual and physical deliverance. Songs of freedom to them probably meant more than it would have to the white man. For free, working towards prosperity, the American dream, to these men, or maybe to us, the bondage would have simply been that bondage of sin. And the freedom mentioned would have been freedom of religious salvation. But for the slave man and woman, who was shackled and sold and mistreated. There is no missing that this language would have been literal as well as spiritual. The African-American spirituals speak strongly of freedom from sin. But not only that, freedom from physical bondage. You see, the slaves were longing for deliverance in both the spiritual and literal sense of the word, just as the psalmist here is longing for deliverance in both the spiritual and literal sense of the word, just as you and I are longing for deliverance in both the spiritual and literal sense of the word, longing to be seen and acknowledged for who we are, longing for healing, longing for the heartache to stop, longing for justice, longing for opportunity, longing for a way forward, longing for deliverance from the current plight that we find ourselves in. And friends, you are not wrong to long for deliverance, not only from sin, but also from your present pain, from the injustice that you suffer, from the pain and hurt wrongfully inflicted upon you, from the suffering that you find yourself in through no fault of your own. Christ has come to deliver us from all things. And through Christ's death, resurrection, we are freed from the bondage of sin. We are no longer slaves to sin. Amen? Amen. There is no greater deliverance or freedom for the human soul than that. Christ has come to free the captives, but he has come to free us in every sense of the word. He delivered the Israelites from Egypt, he brought them back from Babylon to Zion, and he sees your circumstances too, and he is coming to deliver you. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, just like you did in the past, Do it again. And then we're given two pictures. Verse four, restore our fortunes like streams in the Negev. The Negev is a desert. It was in the southern part of Judah. And the word Negev quite literally means dry or parched. So you get the picture. It's a hot, 
desert wilderness. But in the winter, sudden rains could spring up out of nowhere and there would be a downpour that would cause green grass and flowers to sprout up almost overnight. And this desert would miraculously transform from a barren wasteland into a place with green grass and flowers. Quite literally, beauty from ashes. And this is what the psalmist is saying. God, I'm in the desert and I need you to send me some rain. I need you to show up out of nowhere and deliver me from what seems like an impossible situation. The prayer here is for God to show up and do what only God can do. Let's pray like that. Let's pray for God to show up and do what only God can do. And then we get a second picture. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. The sowing is a planting, farming analogy, talking about planting. And this phrase, sow with tears, has really stayed with me. I think a lot of times when we're struggling and we're going through something hard, we want a way out. And we think that our tears, our pain, provide just the excuse that we need to be able to stop sewing. I know that I have felt that way and that's been true for me. I mentioned a little bit earlier about some of my health challenges and over the past three years, my physical capacity has greatly changed from what it once was and it has impacted every aspect of my life. I've gone through all of the emotions that accompany something like that, but one thing has remained constant, the tears. But my tears are not an excuse. I have to keep going, to keep sowing for the kingdom. Now what and how I do that may have to change but friends, as long as we walk this earth, we are called to press on, to keep doing the Lord's business and kingdom work. Even in times of sorrow, there is work to be done. And for me, that means to keep raising my children in the Lord, to keep loving my husband, to keep supporting my students, to keep praying, to keep proclaiming the goodness of the Lord. I have to keep sowing. But it's okay to keep crying too. Because we don't put on a rainbow and flowers and smile Pollyanna type attitude that says it's all okay when it's really not. We cry and we grieve and we lament as we keep sowing. We keep trusting, we keep living a godly life and we keep proclaiming the gospel. Why? Why do we do this? Why do we keep sowing in the midst of tragedy? Because that good work will bear good fruit. That good work will bear good fruit. It says, those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. And then the psalmist elaborates. He says in verse six, he who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. This isn't a question. This is a statement. This is a statement of faith, believing based on the past experiences of God that joy will one day return. This is a statement of hope, hope that all is not lost, though it may seem like it is in this moment, this moment isn't all there is. Scripture is very clear. In this world, you will have trouble 
but take heart. I have overcome the world. Friends, we may sow in this world with tears, but we will reap in the world to come with joy. This psalm does not promise that we will not face trouble, crisis, sickness, loss, despair, but it does promise that we need not face them without hope in the joy to come because our deliverer is coming. We hope for our prayers to be answered in the here and now, in the temporal. And our gracious Father sometimes says yes to that prayer. And sometimes he gives us a foretaste of that joy that is to come. And so pray and hope and believe now for the Lord's deliverance. But regardless of the timing, I can promise you that as it says in Psalm 30, weeping may last for a night, but joy comes in the morning. The morning will dawn and the trumpets will sound and he will come riding in on the white horse, coming to rescue his people. Your crisis will not last forever. Deliverance is coming and at just the right time, he's on his way. There's a song. Um, it's an old song, you probably don't know it. A little teaser, we're gonna play the video for you after the service is done if you wanna stay and watch it. But the verses talk about times where God's people cried out for a deliverer, cried out for deliverance. And the chorus says this. My deliverer is coming. My deliverer is standing by. My deliverer is coming. My deliverer is standing by. And friends, this is why I love this song. Because our deliverer is coming. He has come. He came in the form of a baby and he died on the cross and purchased our salvation with his blood and he conquered death through the resurrection, part one. But part two is gonna be even better. He's coming back. It is a promise. And what we have so far is just a foretaste of the deliverance that is on its way. Our God, our God is strong, he is powerful, he is mighty to save, and the battle for souls is fierce, and many tears and much heartache will be endured while we wait, but do not lose hope. There will be songs of joy sung like we have never sung before, and the coming deliverance will be immeasurably greater. Our deliverer is coming. He's coming for you. It's a promise. And so we wait and we hope and we pray this prayer. God, I remember what you have done in the past and I'm begging you to do it again, only greater. Amen.